to his hand and that looks perfect. But this really does leave me kind of stuck. One of my goals in 2023 is to include more vlog content. Taking you guys on bookish journeys, letting you see my life and my pets and giving you my real time thoughts on books really makes me happy. And in 2023 I am going to be prioritising the things that make me happy. So hopefully you guys are as down with this plan as I am because I have a lot of things that I would like to do in vlogs this year. I do want to have more themed vlogs but I also want to have vlogs like this one which is just like here's a bunch of stuff that I am doing and have done come along and enjoy it with me. That said, this vlog does have a little bit of an accidental theme because the theme of this vlog is make Leanne finish more things on her currently reading stack. I started a bunch of things in like total excitement and then didn't get a chance to really get my teeth into any of them. And while that's obviously really pants for a lot of reasons, it's also kind of a good thing because you know that way when you're reading lots of things simultaneously and then you start finishing them and it's like bam 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 and the satisfaction levels go up like one of those little meters where it's like ding when it hits the top. That's what I'm looking for. That is the vibe, the energy, that is the essence of what I wish to invoke in this vlog. So let's talk a little bit about what books are currently sitting half read on my nightstand that I would like to try and prioritise the finishing off in this vlog. So the first book that I'm halfway through is actually the results of the spoils from that shopping trip to Portobello with Jean and Ashley. I started it pretty much the minute that I got back into the house and I am obsessed. I am living for this book and I am just so salty that I haven't been able to finish it yet. That book is The Things We Do To Our Friends by Heather Darwin. This is a dark academia set at Edinburgh University. We follow a girl named Claire who has started in her first year there and although she is extremely socially awkward, very quiet and finding that she doesn't really fit in with the other university students, she is absolutely determined that this time in university is going to completely reinvent her. She wants new friends, she wants new interests, she wants new passion and before very long as is quite common in dark academia novels Claire falls in with a group of friends. These friends are all very wealthy which is very different from her experience. She is working in a bar to make sure that she has money to be able to do the things that she wants to do and it's very heavily implied that she's going to university using student loans and it's both really really insidious the way that this friend group slowly draws her in and also like desperately clever because in amongst all of this where you are definitely thinking oh Claire you're getting yourself into stuff that you shouldn't be like uh, you're not thinking this all the way through I'm worried for you Claire has these little moments herself which are these complete breaks in temper for want of a better phrase where she does something like smashing a mirror or stealing something that belongs to one of this group 
and you get a flash of like, I don't entirely think you are the person who you tell me that you are. I think I have just under 200 pages to go, but this one is flying by really, really fast and the font is massive. So I do not anticipate that being too much of a problem. Then next up on my Kindle, I want to finish reading Magnolia Parks by Jessa Hastings. 2022 really changed the way that I think about reading, which sounds like really heavy and catastrophic. But what I mean by that is, is that I have realized that sometimes I need to give my brain a break. Part of that was realizing that when I am about to go to sleep, I want to read. Like I want to read myself to sleep. I wasn't allowing myself to do that because I was being triggered quite often by the things in my books. So if I read really heavy topics late at night, quite often the anxiety spiral starts because of course when it's dark and quiet and it's just you and you're sitting in yourself and you're about to go to sleep that's often when a lot of spinning thoughts happen for people and so what I've started to do right before bed is either pick up a graphic novel or pick up a romance book but sometimes because I come from fantasy and horror and thriller the plots in romance aren't enough to drag me through even if the relationship's good and so I asked Becca at the end of 2022 if she could recommend me some messy romances and I ended up picking up Magnolia Parks and it is exactly as messy as Becca said that it was and I am kind of obsessed with finding out what is going to happen. So this one is essentially marketed as an alternative romance so turning all of the tropes that you're used to on their head and not necessarily ending up with a happily ever after or even like happy for now ending and it is about Magnolia and BJ who used to be in a relationship and used to be deeply deeply in love but then BJ cheated on Magnolia and they are now no longer a couple but they are still best friends and they still spend pretty much all of their time together and in fact four nights out of seven, sometimes more than that in a week, they are sleeping in the same bed as each other. And it is this really vicious cycle of BJ wanting to be with Magnolia but Magnolia not being able to trust him and yet still loving him and it has really dragged their entire friend group into it and all of their day-to-day -day lives are marred by the fact that they just can't stay away from each other and yet can't also be together. And Becca was not wrong when she said that it is very much Chuck and Blair from Gossip Girl at their very, very worst but make it London. So I think I'm going to upgrade Magnolia Parks to an anytime read after I finish the things we do to our friends and just read it as I would a normal book and not save it for bedtime. Which means that I can finally get back to reading Hex Appeal by Kate Johnson at bedtime. I think that I left this off at like 68 or 69% which is terrible because if I just have made myself push through I would have finished it by now but this one is actually kind of a prime example of me being like sometimes romance books don't have enough plot to pull me through all the way to the end. Hex Appeal is kind of one of these like cozy supernatural fantasy romances that has come out recently which I'm really really enjoying. This one is also witchy, it's about Essie and she lives in a kind of strange old ramshackle house with a bunch of other witches. It's as close to like a commune as you can possibly get and all of these witches have their own particular powers. Life at Bedlam House is a little bit weird. There's animals that can communicate, there's plants that are definitely alive. Sometimes the house hides particular rooms. It's a very cozy found family situation and I really really love it. And look the romance is nice. The guy is called Josh. He is an American who has run away from his life and he has inherited Bedlam House along with another like bunch of buildings. He discovers when looking back in the record books that the people at Bedlam House haven't paid any rent for hundreds of years uh, but when he goes to try and find Bedlam House the house hides itself so he can't find it. It's a really like nice wholesome sweet cinnamon roll kind of romance and I'm really enjoying it. It's just that together with the fact I don't want it to end I would much prefer if this were a series and we could just stay in this house for longer but also the fact that the romance is the only plot in this. I'm just not compelled to keep coming back to it. So this one should get bumped back up when I read Magnolia Parks. And anything else which I pick up and read or finish in the meantime, I will also give to you as reading updates at some point. She likes 
to film a video that I very much intensely do not want to film. <laughs> Exposing myself on the internet. So I thought I would come here and update the vlog because I owe you an update. I have in fact finished a book but also I am uh, I'm wasting time and putting that video that I'm supposed to be filming off. <laughs> you are now complicit in all of my excuses. Haha. <laughs> so as I said I have now finished a book. I have finished Things We Do To Our Friends by Heather Darwin and <sighs> This is very much a book of two halves. So the first half of this book, like I said before, is very sort of slow building dark academia setting. And I say dark academia very loosely because although these people are actually in university, there's very little of the university setting in the background and there's very little of them doing any kind of university work or thinking about any kind of new stuff that they're learning. It's much more like university is just the background for everything that's going on and a convenient way for these people to meet. But the dark academia atmosphere is still there. It still feels very cloying and close. It still feels very obsessive. It still feels like that thing that happens in the secret history where time becomes elastic. And the actual narrative is covering quite an expansive time. It's covering their entire first semester, but it doesn't feel like that because we're just very much in Claire's head as she's like enjoying and reveling and getting pulled into this really toxic friend group, which is also interesting because in a lot of dark academia that I have read, it takes a while for the main character to realize that they're in a toxic friendship. But in this book, Claire is very much aware that these people are not good people from the minute that she steps in and she steps in with her eyes open which very much led me to the like this is an unreliable narrator and she very much is. She very much delivers on that. There's just so many moments of tiny minutia peppered through where you're like girl you're doing, you're doing what? And I love that because although Claire is being pulled into the thrall of these people you're never entirely sure how enthralled she is or if she actually knows exactly what she's doing the entire time and that was delicious, that was perfect. And she would drop this little nugget in where you're like, ugh, and you would be physically full body repulsed by Claire and by her choices and then you would be like back to thinking, oh poor naive girl who's been drawn in by this horrible group. And 
despite the fact that she reminded us of that very many times throughout the novel, I kept forgetting, I kept being drawn back in by Claire, which is incidentally what's happening to the actual characters and oh, it was just, it was just so cleverly plotted. I loved it. However, halfway through this book, a plot point happens wherein Tabitha, who is really the kind of leader of this group, the very chaotic, very impulsive, very beautiful girl with a lot of money, Tabitha has an idea for a business that they can all run together. And when they get into that, it's a very different book. We leave the kind of just dark academia setting of it and it starts being something else. It starts being a bit thrillery. And I will admit that when that happened, I did have a tiny dip in interest. But although for me there was that little stagnant part in the middle, as soon as we got past that, as soon as we got properly into the meat of the second half of the book, it felt like all of the reveals were like a boulder that was rolling downhill. Another reveal and another reveal and another fact and another thing that was going on the whole time that you didn't realise and that was perfect. Heather Darwin did such a good job of being like, do you see it? No you don't and it was great because you guys know I don't like sitting and picking apart plots as I go. I want to be sitting there going, gasp, I can't believe that that just happened and that was me for the entire entirety of the second half of this. So if you're new to my channel this year then you will probably not know that I don't generally give star ratings when I review books anymore because I don't necessarily find it useful. Five stars means something different to you than it means to me and so does one star. For the purposes of like explaining my thought process on this, this was like a four and a half star book all the way up until the last 30 pages. And then a thing happens that was another one of these reminding you that Claire is actually not a nice person moments and I just, I couldn't forgive it and I couldn't get over it because it didn't need to be there. All of the other Claire's not a good person moments had been very clearly signposted as a but remember, but by this point in the book, all of the reveals about Claire have already been done and we are clear about what kind of person she is and what has been going on the whole time. And I really didn't feel like this thing needed to be done. It didn't need to be there to cement who she was as a person. And it's so hard not to just tell you exactly what it is because I normally would in other books, but it is a bit of a spoiler, especially coming so late in this book. So all I'll say is that it's a moment that includes an animal and I was not okay with it. It didn't it didn't add anything to the plot to be there. It was just an unnecessarily like extra bit of ooh look how nasty she was and I really feel like her editors should have at some point been like ah I don't think we need that and that did genuinely knock it down to a four star for me because I think it was done really clumsily at the end of such a tight book and also it was a different kind of gross from all of the other kinds of gross that Claire had been before and I just yeah. Despite star ratings or anything like that, that is one book completed for this vlog so I am very pleased about that. I have also read since we last talked a massive chunk of Magnolia Parks but I think I am going to wait and talk about this book as a whole when I have finished it because I have a lot of complex thoughts about it. I will just say that I am still absolutely loving it. I did not expect to be so invested in the characters when I went into this one and regardless of the occasional moment of extreme cheese in this book or the occasional moment where I was like "Ooh, that was lifted directly from Gossip Girl I I think it is safe to say that Jessa Hastings has hooked somebody into reading all of the rest of the books in this series which is great because that also means that that is a book that has to go onto my reading spreadsheet that I'm about to film in a moment so <laughs> send good wishes my way because next time you see me I might be a dried and shriveled little husk.
The consistency of the lighting for this clip is currently status questionable. So I apologise if we are suddenly plunged into darkness but I thought that I would take this 10 minutes and I really only have 10 minutes because Amy is here and we have more plans and everything is chaos. Which is also the reason that I am currently sitting on the floor in my study because stuff is um, everywhere else. Between Amy's suitcase and our haul books and all of the cat stuff that we've crammed into this room to make space for like three people in this house. Everything is just a little bit everywhere but it's okay we move. So I am here to finally wrap up all of my thoughts about Magnolia Parks in one clip. In one neat bow if you like. Except the bow is kind of not this size, it's more this size because I have I have a lot of thoughts guys. Because much like things that we do to our friends this book has very much been a book of two completely different halves for me and I am really torn about it. So I think the last time that I mentioned Magnolia Park I was still in that complete love affair stage with it where I was like oh my god this is a great find, I love this, I am immediately picking up the second book in the series. Although my dudes I think I am improving as a book buying person because even though I was fully in the thralls and I was like I love this and I can see me being obsessed with this whole series I did not actually buy the second one until I had finished the first book. So a little tiny round of applause for me and I mean a, a tiny round of applause because I'm looking at my haul books for the month over there but I did a, 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 a tiny round of applause. So yeah I was absolutely loving it in the beginning and to be fair a lot of my reasons for loving it are actually identical to Becker's reasons for loving it. It is classic Chuck and Blair from the game playing, from the like involving everybody else in the drama just so that they can avoid saying things to each other, the passing of messages through people and the weird coincidences that they end up in situations together. So yeah everything about Magnolia is basically Blair and the other reason that Becca loved it so much was the level of angst which is also the reason that I loved it. And again the reason that it was tugging me through to read so quickly because the drama felt like a very teenage level of drama that as an adult most of us can't actually allow ourselves to have in our life. Like we've got jobs and friends to support and laundry to do and stuff like that but these people do not have any of the trappings of a normal life so they are allowed to just be as emotional about their feelings as they want to be and I loved that. And it also did one very particular thing which I think is going to spoil me for a lot of romance books in the future and that is that it started like mid-relationship. We're past a breakup already and yet we're fully in the thrall of I can't quit you but I really need to quit you because you're terrible for me. And I feel like in romance books we never see this. Of course there are the soft breakups that we have on the course to being happily ever after but we never actually get the proper hard breakup where everybody's torn up, their feelings are irretrievably broken in some ways and yet we are still in this relationship like we never see that part. So all of that was perfect and I loved it but like I said it's a book of two halves and I guess a little thing in the middle because the little thing in the middle for me was it was too long. It's like 430 pages long. There were scenes that were essentially repeated ad nauseum over and over again and though I know that was there to show BJ and Magnolia's pattern of like constantly getting back into the same bad situations and bad headspaces I felt like that could have been cut out. So that's the middle on to the other half and the other half was I hated BJ. For a start Beej as a nickname is awful for two reasons. Firstly it's a really terrible nickname and secondly it's the nickname that my mother gives my father and so having a romantic interest with like it's a very niche nickname Beach and I oh I really didn't like it I really didn't like it however as a person I just don't see the point in BJ. I was not interested in any of the descriptions of him. I didn't buy any of his relationships with the other guys around him. I felt like every other guy in the cast was a better choice for Magnolia than BJ was. There were just so many other guys who had like had a passing interest with or flirted with or dated Magnolia in the past that I was just like choose him, choose him, choose the one who uses his words. That one, the one over there, not this one. And while I really understand what Jessa Hastings was trying to do with BJ, like I saw where she was trying to go with his character, I just never bought it. Every time something goes wrong with Magnolia he goes and abuses some form of substance which is in itself massively manipulative and that was my issue with this. Although it was like massively toxic all the way through and they both did things that were like not okay. There were multiple times where Magnolia tries throughout the book to pull away from BJ and to change her pattern and to do something else and it was like she was just never allowed 
to do that and it was screwed up in a way that I couldn't actually enjoy like I didn't enjoy going there in the characters heads but by mid book there are of course other love interests in Magnolia and BJ's lives because they are dating around each other quite a lot and the person that came into Magnolia's life I was like yes this this is how you have a guy who is not necessarily fully healthy in his relationship like he can learn and grow and he is fundamentally still a good guy so I suppose if you look at the whole experience of reading Magnolia Parks it did its job it made me feel intense emotions it kept me reading through 430 odd pages of just romance with no real other plot and despite the fact that I really despised one of the love interests it still kept me going to the end on the other other hand though I hated BJ so much that it makes me question whether I want to read anything else in this universe where he is going to be popping up in the background because the second book in this universe is following two other characters who are in the friend group of Magnolia and BJ and I'm quite interested in where that relationship goes but there's no way for it not to reference Magnolia and BJ quite a lot and for there to be crossover in their friend groups so I'm gonna see BJ whether I like him or not and I don't. So I'm still torn about whether I'm going to pick up book two. I think I probably will. I'm leaning more towards yes than to no but I think it might be a little bit of time before I do that because one of the things that I'm really noticing while filming this vlog and actually paying attention to how I read books at night and what books I read at night, I think I need to try and find some way of finding a book that's going to like keep me compelled and pull me through that doesn't have really really high stakes with like mortal peril and you know some of the heavy stuff that I talked about earlier in this vlog but I don't know if this is it. <laughs> I don't know if angsty romance is the thing. I just uh if you have any suggestions guys then please please leave them down below. So I am gonna go now because like I said we have a lot of plans. There's more book buying in my future which is gonna be interesting for my challenge of reading 80% of the new books that I bought this year. And so next time you see me I'm probably gonna be here telling you that I finished Hexapeal which I haven't touched. I have not touched at all in this vlog since I mentioned it. So yeah let's hope my next update is me finishing Hex Appeal. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, sure. Okay. You left the kitchen light on and it's too dark over there. It's better in your arms. Hold me when I'm scared. Will I be safe if I find a way to keep us both like this? Cause I can't imagine being a So I have finished Hex Appeal and I am once again a conflicted human. So surely it can't just be me who thinks that it's really weird that every book in this vlog has had like a really good half that's worked for me and another half where I'm like yeah. I feel like mostly with books I end up either mostly liking it or mostly not liking it. I don't usually have like such a split down the middle 
opinion but here we are. Hex Appeal was once again a book of two halves. So as I said to you earlier on in this vlog, I didn't actually have a lot left of this book, but it took me a really, really long time to want to pick it up. In fact, I had to actually physically force myself to sit at my desk and finish reading it. But that said, at the start of this vlog, I had a ton of positive things to say about this book and those still stand. So the things that I liked, I absolutely adored the setting. I feel like Bedlam House itself really became a character in this book because it had a sort of sentience and it tried to protect and also sometimes to be sneaky and tricksy with the witches who lived in the house. It became this larger thing, this larger entity where I really just wanted to spend more time here, more time getting to know the house, more time getting to know why that room existed and why it hides that room. All of these things were the things that I wanted to hear more about and that might be I guess because I love haunted house books but it's not just haunted houses I like. I like it when an actual place, when a destination becomes a character and that's not just necessarily a building but sometimes also a town or a city or a part of the world because I guess all of that really ultimately harks back to fantasy world building which of course brings me from place being character to the actual characters I loved the background characters in this book. There's a ghost, there's an ex-witch, there are even animals that are technically big characters in this book. I really loved the distribution of different kinds of powers around different kinds of people so it was like the power fitted the personality of the witch who had it, like her powers had organically developed to complement her but also to keep her safe in a way but also to help her to grow. There was a non-binary character in here who was able to change their outward appearance to match what their inner gender felt like that day and that was just so lovely, particularly because the main setting for where Bedlam House is is a tiny English village and nobody in the pub blinked an eye when this witch came in looking the way that they did and that was... <laughs> There's something like very cosy about that, something very comforting, just about the normalisation of having a queer experience which doesn't need a massive conversation, it's just this person exists alongside these other people. And finally the last thing that I loved was the plot out with the romance because there was actually a background bit of plot going on here which of course was massively eclipsed by the romance and it didn't really get its own time to shine and that I think ultimately is my issue with this book. What I wanted this book to be was an urban fantasy series with a mystery or a cosy mystery element wherein I was going to get plenty of time to spend time with these characters, to get to know the town, to get to know the house. I wanted there to be magical consequences. I wanted other types of beings to start popping up in the world. I wanted to focus on that meat of the story but I feel like the author really took on too much in this book. I feel like she wanted it to be that thing but she also probably knew that it would market better as a romance than as an urban fantasy with romance and so that's where we ended up and as a result of that I feel like the love story in this was very lacklustre. It was sweet and all but I feel like it could have been a background romance that happened in five pages and I was just really resentful every time it took up more space. Also I was just not particularly bothered by Josh as a human. He's very very badly fleshed out compared to the other characters in this book, all of whom seem to have fewer lines and fewer occasions to shine but who I know more about and I'm more deeply connected to than I am with Josh. And I think we're at risk at this point in the video of you guys thinking that I just don't like romance books but I do and I have read a ton of them in the past. And it's not even that I just like one kind. I like contemporary romance, I like Regency romance. I've even enjoyed steampunk romance and I hate steampunk as a genre. It's very much not my happy place. It's not that I don't like romance itself but I think what I'm finding is that if I'm going to read romance as a thing it either needs to be something like urban fantasy or fantasy romance where there is a bigger plot and there are higher stakes and there is more reasons for me to be rooting for these people to be together or it has to be a really deep and introspective romance where you get a lot of character study time and you spend a lot of time in the characters heads and seeing their lives outside of each other and then really being shown on the page why they work because I feel like that has been missing in a lot of the romances that I've been picking up recently and I'm just really 
really disappointed in it. And it's making me sad because I want to like romance more than I currently like romance, I think. I like romance more as a concept in my life than I do in my actual books. But this really does leave me kind of stuck. Because as I've said, the reason that I was reading romance in the first place before bed was to try and find something that wasn't necessarily going to massively trigger me with a lot of talk about death and existential crises and massive consequences. Both romance and cosy fantasy, which is the two places that I thought Mm, maybe I could go there to find something that will fulfill that requirement for me. I have found myself just absolutely bored out of my brain. Or like in the case of Legends and Lattes where I really loved some of the characters and I really really loved the setting but I was missing the plot to pull me through the pages so actually maybe I just wanted a traditional fantasy. Uh, so yeah I'm stuck. I don't know where to go now. I don't know which genre to pick up or what type of book would work for me. The Hunt for the Perfect Book before bed book continues. And like I've said guys, if you have any ideas, if you think that you could tell me the perfect bedtime book, then please tell me that down below. I would really like to hear that. I really hope that you've liked this first vlog of the year and seeing all of our shenanigans. If you have made it this far in the video then please leave me the little bed emoji down below considering that 90% of this video was concerned with what will not make Leanne cry at bedtime. And as always if you have read any of the books that I've talked about here today or you think that you could recommend me anything that I would like slightly better then please leave that down in the comments below. If you are new here and you like this first vlog of the year please subscribe for more that are already in the works and if you like this video then please hit that thumbs up because it really does help my channel and I will speak to all of you guys really soon. Bye!